I want to give you a question, uh, and I don't want you to answer it now, but I want you to think about it and keep it in mind uh, as we go through the talk tonight. And it's actually a two-part question. The first part is, what threat to liberty are you personally most concerned about? So that's part one. And then part two is, what is the most effective thing that you personally can do about it? You personally, and that's, that's the key part. So don't think about something someone else can do or I wish society would change in this or that way. It's, it's me personally, you personally, what uh, can you do about it? What I'm hoping is that the things I talk about tonight will help you answer that, that question. All right, so I'm gonna start out with a story about how my view on this subject, about what I can do to defend my own liberty, uh, profoundly changed. Now, it's been basically my job to defend liberty since I was about uh, 20 years old. I was a Duke University student, and I got paid $250 for my first article. At that point, you know, you become a professional writer, and I'm writing and defending liberty. And so at that point, it was really my job. People are paying me, in this case, the donors of the organization that paid me for the article, you know, to defend their liberties, figure out how to make the world a freer place. And I did my best at that year after year. And my, my primary focus, though, was number one on understanding the issues as clearly as I, I possibly could, which is, is an important thing. So I need to understand the philosophy of liberty. I need to understand the details of every issue that I was commenting on. Um, and then figure out how to communicate that as clearly as possible to other people. Uh, so, so far, so good. And, and up until about 2009, my view was that, OK, I'm doing all that I can. This is, you know, I'm, I'm on the right track. I'm, everything I'm doing is the right thing to be doing. And then I had a conversation that completely changed and permanently changed my perspective on this. And it was of all places on an airplane. Uh, I got up to go to the bathroom. Very exciting. And uh, I had been sitting and working very furiously on an outline for a talk on petroleum that I was giving. Some people in this room have actually heard a, a version of that talk. And I, I, I'm pretty meticulous about it, so I'm just making all these little edits and fine-tuning all these words and trying to make sure the structure is right. And I've got a copy of a book about the myths of green energy. Uh, so I come back, and the guy sitting next to me starts quizzing me uh, about it. And he says he has a background in energy. and. He, he asked me just a series of questions like boom, 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 boom about like solar, wind, oil, coal, natural gas. And I'm feeling great because I can do this. I know this stuff inside out. And then he asked me a question that I had no answer to. And that question was, what do you want somebody to do when they leave your talk? And some of you have seen me answer questions before. I'm generally good at answering questions. Uh, I think things through so it comes easily to me. And I was just stunned. I was just there with my mouth open. And my mind kept running through, like, yeah, what? I should have something I want people to do. So I'm giving a talk. There has to be a purpose of the talk. And yet, what? What do I want to go to a website? OK, what do I want them to do with the website? And then am I even telling them to go anywhere? And then it just occurred to me that I was doing, you know, he, he basically said to me, look, you're doing all this thinking, which is great. and yet." You're not thinking about the result. So you're, you're doing all this work, and yet where's, where is the result in the work? And he said, so you, you have, in everything you do, uh, the guys, and the guy turned out to be a you know, very successful businessman, very successful actually in media and energy and a lot of different fields. His name is uh, Dennis Ferrier, and he's still, still a mentor to me to this day. Um, but he said, you know, Alex, everything you do in life, including this field, you have to require results. And that really made me start thinking differently. It, it sort of put into question all the activities I was doing, made me wonder, OK, what is this actually accomplishing? And then more positively, what can I do that's the highest leverage to accomplish the most? Well, so I had this conversation with Ferrier, and then I realized, wow, I know I have so many role models to follow in this field. But it's not just the role models that I have intellectually, the people who are really bright and help clarify my thinking. It's the entrepreneurs of the world. There's a ton to learn about spreading ideas from looking at the best practices of entrepreneurs. I started looking at what I was doing. I would go to talks like this. I would listen to them afterward. I would just pay attention to audiences and realize, OK, 
Just on a primitive level, some things work and some things don't. Some things go over well with the audience, and some things you know only go so-so, and then some things you know, occasionally you bomb. It's just the nature of the beast. And one thing I realized that, that really changed my direction, which I had never expected, but which I got from having this results orientation, was that the number one thing when I was talking about, um, say, oil or coal or natural gas and having a pro-industrial outlook, the number one thing that was effective was my own just positive enthusiasm about industry. Like I would, I would talk about oil and I would talk about just how, for instance, half the things in this room are made of oil. So the carpet's made of oil, the coating on the desk is made of oil, the buttons on your shirt are made of oil, the insulation uh, is made of oil, the whole building was built using oil-based machines. And I realized that, that, that the more I would get people excited about the technology and understand how amazing it was and connect it to their personal lives, I would get disproportionately good results to when I would just criticize uh, inferior technologies or bad things. And I kind of pushed that, and that's what really led me, that was one of the things that led me to start a whole new organization called the Center for Industrial Progress. Now, the Center for Industrial Progress is it's offering an alternative to the dominant green movement. The green movement tends to be allegedly anti-pollution and anti-development, and it mixes those together, anti-pollution and anti-development, and Center for Industrial Progress is basically, basically recognizes that pro-development is actually what improves our environment. So pro-development and anti-pollution uh, go together. But the key was, it's the Center for Industrial Progress. It's being for, we need to be for something good, not just say, oh, those green guys are jerks. They're doing this and this and this. Because I realized the green movement gets a lot of people on its side because it offers something that seems like a positive. It offers an ideal. It says, look, we can have a green economy. We can have a good environment. And there's no way to counter that by saying, you're wrong, and then offer nothing. The way to counter that is by offering something positive and amazing, saying industrial progress is actually, you know, by using a lot, by producing a lot of energy, and by innovating, and by using machines, and by using technology, we create, create a dramatically better human environment, in, cost, in contrast to the green policies, which restrict all that development, and actually make our environment worse. So I thought this, this really, this positive idea needs its own organization. And at the same time, I was just obsessed with this idea of how to figure out the best way to do everything. And I knew you need, I needed my own organization. I wanted my own organization so that I could test, basically have it be a laboratory. And anything we could figure out that either other people were doing that we could copy, or ideas that we had that sounded good, we could test them uh, and put them into practice. Now, it's only six months in, so, you know, we've, we're still at the beginning, but already uh, the amount I've learned myself about what makes uh, what how to be more effective, and the amount of people I work with have learned, I think is at least has been just amazingly gratifying to me. So that's that's what I want to share. And I want to put this in context of, of why I think this is such an important problem for being an effect, effective advocate of liberty. Now, I want to contrast it. Because I, my, my thesis is that people advocating li liberty are radically inefficient. That in general, in fighting for liberty, we're radically inefficient. And that's actually really good news, because we're losing pretty badly. So if we were at maximum efficiency, there wouldn't be much cause uh, for hope. Well, one, one of the reasons, one of the re that's true, right? One of the reasons why it's inefficient is because if you contrast it to, say, Rockefeller, how does Rockefeller know he's doing the right thing? How does he know he's being efficient? Well, he has a certain cost of input. He has land, labor, machines, uh, you know, materials, etc. And then he makes a certain money, a uh, certain money, a certain amount of money by what he pulls in. And the difference between those is profit. And the bigger his profit, the more he knows he's creating new value, and the more he knows that he's being uh, efficient. But in the world of advocacy, particularly the nonprofit world, which is where uh, I come from, incidentally, my organization is not exactly a nonprofit. It actually is not a nonprofit, which I'll talk about later why that is. But in the nonprofit world, or any time you're accepting donations, there's no real, it, it's hard to tell if you're being efficient. Because let's say, you know, you give me $100. Well, you're giving me $100 not to influence you, usually. But to influence, you know, these other guys over there, and it's hard to measure. Well, did they? Did this third part? Did these third parties get influenced? 
So the, it, it's, it's just, there's actually a similar problem with politicians in terms of uh, incentives. So there's a question of, well, how do I know whether I'm doing a good job spending other people's money? If, if people are spending their money on a product for themselves, it's pretty easy to tell if you're doing a good job. But if they're spending money on a product for someone else, something like ideas, it's a very, very difficult problem. And I think that's important to realize, and it's not just for organizations, it's for us as individuals, because we have to, that, that means that we have to be at an even higher level of thinking, because we don't have a market to tell us, and profit and loss to tell us good job, bad job. I mean, you can have donor, if you're an organization, you can have donors telling you, which is important, you need to stay uh, in existence, but that still is not, that still doesn't tell you too much, it just tells you some people are willing to give you money. But if, if you want to know, are you making a difference, you need to figure out ways uh, of measuring that. Now my thinking, one way to measure that is to put it as much as possible, to put activities, and this is more for organizations, but to put activities as much in the profit sphere as possible. So for example, speaking. Speaking is something that you know, I, I do for money, I don't, I don't do it for free. And one of the reasons, besides the fact that I like the money, is that and it keeps people honest. If an audience says, hey Alex, like, I really want to hear you, but you know, I can't gather together X amount of money to do it, it shows that, nine times out of 10, it shows that they're not really serious, that it's not really an audience that's gonna be worth uh, the time. And particularly with business audiences, the more, the more successful audiences you have, if they're paying real money for stuff, that's the best because that, that's a lot better. So let's say, you know, just to use a hypothetical figure, let's say like someone pays $5,000 for me to speak to a group of separate businessmen versus a group of businessmen pays $5,000. Well, it's obviously 10 times better if the group of businessmen pays it because the reason they're paying it is, to, is because they want the ideas. If they're paying for the ideas, that's great. So one of the, the ideas with Center for Industrial Progress, first and foremost, was we want to monetize everything that we can possibly monetize. Um, so when we have, you know, when we bring people on, we want to figure out ways to raise their profile, to be able to have them give speeches for money to get, and to figure out what, what leads to that. Because if people are paying money, it's not a perfect indication, but it's a really, really good uh, category of, of indication. Now most of you, um, you know, are, are probably not in a position where you plan on starting your own think tank anytime soon. So that might not apply exactly to you, but it's at least helpful to keep in mind that there is this problem and that monetizing is one, is one solution. But then, and I actually for a while I thought, you know what, I don't want anyone to ever give me money, ever. I don't want any donations. I just want to do everything for profit. Like, I don't like asking for money. I just, I, I like naming a price when someone, if someone really wants my product, I like telling them what it costs. But, you know, asking a third party for money, that's no good. Um, but then I realized that that's not really, that's, that's, that's not really a good answer. Because there are lots and lots and lots of activities that are incredibly beneficial and even more beneficial than giving a public speech to an audience um, in which it's very hard to get the people to pay you money. And the number one example of that is education. So over the years, um, on a pro bono basis, for example, I've uh, mentored a bunch of students, actually, including uh, Derek, who's in this room. And that's some of the most valuable time that I've spent. Now, no one paid me for it, but in terms of, if I look at that investment, if I look at the investment that I've spent in, in like talented young individuals, and I think about, you know, imagine I get an hourly rate for my time. There are a couple people that I've influenced who are either on their way or are already becoming like a big deal. They're writing books. I mean, for instance, one guy I work with just wrote a book and I got the lead acknowledgement in the book even though I never saw the book or had anything to do. And it was just because I trained this one guy. And I spent, who knows, maybe 100 hours, 200 hours over the years. But that's nothing compared with the time it takes to write a book. So, and he's going to be right, and he, it's not only I get, I get the leverage of, what he, of his book, but of everyone he teaches and he influences. So it's clear that there are these really, really high leverage ways to influence other people where you, the person is not necessarily paying you, but it's really, really uh, effective. But the thing is, we need to be ruthless, absolutely ruthless about figuring out when we're doing that and when we're just throwing our time away. Because the easiest thing in the world in activism to just throw your time away and figure, 
oh, well, as long as I'm saying stuff in the right direction, as long as, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's in a Facebook comment section or on the White House lawn. Well, you know, it does matter. It matters a lot where you're saying it, how you're saying it. There are so many different dimensions that determine are you using your time and, and resources and voice in a way that's actually making a difference, or are you, are you throwing it away? And so one of the big things we had to figure out was who are the audiences, who are the most high leverage audiences that we need to reach? Because one key thing to realize in activism is not all audiences are created equal, not, you know, not by a long shot. Um, so for us, the audiences are, and I, there's six, so I sometimes forget them in order, but, um, and these aren't in order of influence, it's just these are six important ones, more or less in alphabetical order. Um, so well, I'll just take them in order and explain. Uh, well, there's intellectuals in the field, so people in our field is energy, industry, environment. So into the, the professionals who are spreading ideas in the field, that's one. Number two is industry. So the people, act, the actual practitioners in the field. Uh, number three is uh, political officials. So the people actually implementing the policies that we have to live with, that whatever we're doing ultimately has to bear on politics, right? We're not just here to talk. We're here to influence policy. So even if we're doing it at a high level, we, need, we want it to connect to political officials. Um, number four is media. So, and, and media, I want to be clear, media means the media, the leaders of the media. I don't just mean get published, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a second, but just getting published, especially these days, it's the easiest thing in the world because we have an internet and it's basically free to get published. And lots of organizations are more, even prestigious ones like Forbes and others, they're more than happy to give you space. You can get your own column, and that, can, that might be good, but it might also be someone just wants to fill up their web page because you know, there's a 24 hour news cycle and there's there's infinite competition, but the, the leaders of the media, the people who are really deciding what stories are merit-worthy and what aren't, and more importantly, what positions are worth covering and what aren't, if you can get to those guys, that's incredible, but especially because we're, we're trying to shape the debate and bring in this idea of industrial progress, that media leaders are a very huge audience. Uh, and then number five, and this is relevant here, is, is students. I mean, you just, with students, it's, it's just as a matter of fact, you've got the longest time horizon of potential influence in terms of what they can do, and at the, they're at the most influenceable time in life. This is the, this is the time in life where people are most looking uh, for new ideas. So whatever the field they're in, you want to catch people as young as possible. And then the, the last thing, the last category I have for influence is what I'll call talent. And talent, I mean primarily talent that we can get to work for us in one way or another. And you know, just getting a couple uh, of talented people you know, can just completely, can completely change uh, the game for a company. Or you think of Apple, like they had Steve Wozniak at the beginning of the company. If they didn't have him, you know, where would they be? If they didn't have jobs, where would they be? It's just two really talented guys, but they, they change it. Now, so, so far all we have is, um, could you just stop moving that? It's actually oh. flashing in my eye. <laughs> it's a sort of bright yellow straw, it's like a straw light over there. Um, so, so far I've basically just given you a wish list, which is, I would like to change these people, which is great, right? But it doesn't really tell you too much. What's really important then is the question of how. And I want to talk about sort of the how of how I think you target these specific groups or how we target these specific groups. And then I want to talk about certain general principles beyond that that apply to influencing everyone in these groups and everyone uh, in general. So the issue with, um, and, but there's an underlying principle with how I'm going to talk about the six groups. And this, this is something that I really look to Steve Jobs for. I mean, Jobs, Steve Jobs was brilliant at many, many things. But what, what strikes me the most about him is that he has the deepest understanding of customer needs that I've ever seen. I mean, he understands what you need more than you understand. And he can show you, and he has such a, he can really get inside the customer's head and think about what is actual, what do they actually aspire to? What do they actually want? You know, what do they fear? And, and figure out how to make something amazingly valuable because of that. And I remember um, 
in the book, in the recent autobiography by Isaacson, Walter Isaacson, there's a, a, a section that I love, and I'm not sure if Jobs is supposed to look good in it or bad in it, but I took it as something to aspire to, where he's talking about what, and I might get this a little wrong, but, but what the menu looks like. And the menu just, the menu at the top didn't look quite right. And someone said, Steve, it's just a menu. And he used a bunch of curse words and basically said, someone is going to look at this every day. You know, millions of people look at this every day of their lives while they're using this computer. You're telling me it's just a menu? This needs to look good. And that's, that's what Jobs has. He's got this amazing uh, ability to really recognize that you know, to, to be an effective salesman, you need to offer real value to the customer that the customer understands. And I think in the world of influencing, that, that corresponds directly. If you want to influence people, you need to show that your ideas are valuable to them. It can't just be, oh, here, I have something, I'm right about something, you know, come listen to me or come follow me or give me money. It's not just I'm right. You have to be right in a way that actually matters to people's lives, to people who have a million things to do. And one of my favorite principles of marketing is, no one cares about you. And it's very true. And you guys didn't get up in the morning thinking about how do I benefit Alex Epstein, nor should you have. Uh, now, I sort of got up in the morning thinking about you, but I had a talk. Um, so, what a, so with each of these audiences, there's a huge benefit, but it has to be a trade. I want, we want to benefit by influencing them, but then what are we going to offer them to influence? So let's, let's go through them. Now, intellectuals. So the benefit of, of intellectuals is that you have, if you can influence another thinker in the field, that's huge leverage because he is, he's in the business of spreading ideas to lots and lots of people. So if we can get, say, industrial progress in the terminology, or we can just get them, I mean, some of you are more familiar with what we do than others, but if we can get people doing what I call taking the moral high ground in, in energy debates, where instead of viewing, say, oil as environmentally bad, it's viewed as environmentally good because it, it, whatever its negative byproducts, the positive products improve the human environment so much. If, you, if we can do that, it's just, it's absolutely huge. And the thing is, we've actually been, to me, shockingly uh, successful at that in just six months. I mean, there's been people who are senior people in the field who have publicly said, you know, you know, it's hard to even repeat because it's just really nice stuff about like how you're the leader in this field. Everyone needs to hear your message on energy. You know, you're the teacher of the field. And I take that as a compliment, but the only way that we were able to do that and are able to do that is because we think very carefully in terms of what, how are, can we make our ideas valuable? We don't just say, oh, we have some ideas, everyone should accept them. I talk to these individuals, you know, and meet them one-on-one, -on -one, and I kind of see, well, how do my ideas fit into what they need? And one of the things that intellectuals need, if, especially if they're on the pro-liberty, uh, non-green side, they need really effective arguments. And it turns out that their arguments about environment aren't too effective because they're missing certain pieces of the puzzle. And they're missing a positive alternative, and we provide a positive alternative. But because, because it's positioned as, look, this is, we, you, need, you need these arguments, they'll make you a lot more effective. Um, because it's put in a value context, it's way, way more effective than what I would often do in the past, which is just throw out stuff in the world and then hope it sticks. And there, it's, so it's on that level, and it's on the level of detail things. It's even just a matter of when we write stuff. It's a rule now at Center for Industrial Progress. If you write anything, you have to send it to the important people in the field. Because otherwise, why are you wasting your time? And it's narcissistic to think that all the important people are going to get up in the morning and come to our website. But it's really easy for us to bring our website to them. And what we've had is, um, for instance, one of our um, top guys, Eric Dennis, who's a physicist, no one in the, in the global warming debate knew of him at all two months ago. And yet he's been getting great feedback from top physicists who are published. And um, on one of the leading climate blogs, his was the number one post in the last month. And that would have, the person would have never heard of him, and the post would have never gotten any traction had we not just had been focused on this, this audience. So it just be results focused. It, just like in life, it just changes every little detail. And sometimes it's just the smallest thing. Sometimes it's sending an email. Sometimes it's a big thing, like having a whole new idea about how to argue about environmental issues. But everything has to be aligned. Everything has to be aligned with results. And the point here is not that we 
always do this successfully. Um, far, far from it. We're just in the beginning. The point is that this is the right way to do it, and and we should all think about that. And, and certainly, we you know will improve all the time. But everyone who cares about liberty needs to think in this way. And the point is, to the extent we do it, the results are crazy. And we're it is just at the very beginning. So industry. Now industry is again, this has been from the time I've been doing this, been writing about business professionally, I have wanted to be the chance to get to speak, you know, to businessmen and give them a piece of my mind about, you know, this is how you should defend themselves, this is how you should think. And yet, surprise of all surprises, the businessmen didn't just come to me begging on their of their own volition, even though I thought I made a lot of good arguments um, over the years. But then recently, I had an opportunity, I can't give the, the details because it's, it's partially under wraps, but one of the largest trade organizations, um, energy trade organizations in the world, invited me uh, to keynote their annual conference in front of 200 senior level executives in the energy field. So this was something like that I had dreamed of my whole life, and I still do. Um, but the, so it's, it's like a fantastic opportunity but the, the illustration here is that this, it didn't come just because I was so great, or however good I am, that's not, that's not, was not the only element involved. Of course, I had to be competent and I had to offer value. But it was that we deliberately focused on showing, we were deliberately focused on showing industry, look, you guys are getting killed. You're horrible at defending yourselves. Nobody likes you. Um, and they should, you do a lot, now you do some things I don't like, like ask favors from the government, but you do a lot of, you're being criticized for the good things. And look, we, know, we have arguments that are right, that you don't know about, and we have arguments that we can show influence students and influence adults and have people saying, after your lecture, I love the oil industry now, or I appreciate it. Um, and by selling it to them, by saying, look, our ideas are of value to you, we get, you know, we get this category. Of result. But without that kind of without that kind of focus, without trying to be a Steve Jobs like as we can, though we're certainly nowhere near his level at this point, it's it's just it's amazing that you just go from it goes from this perspective of wow, I really wish there's this wish it like, oh I really hope a businessman, you know, some businessman asked us to speak. Hope is no longer a word in our vocabulary. We don't hope, we test. We analyze and we test. So we think, okay, we want this. Let's analyze things, let's look at best practices, let's try things, realizing that eight out of 10 things will fail. And then we see what the results are. But there's no such thing as, oh, I hope this industry comes to us, because it's, it simply doesn't work. It's, this is business. And this is the point of, of what I'm talking about here. This is business. Fighting for liberty is a business. It's not a hobby. As one of my mentors said, um, a guy named Lloyd Urban, who was a jiu-jitsu teacher of mine and also really taught me a lot about marketing, he said, you know, he was talking about jiu-jitsu but about anything, he says, you know, if you treat it like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it'll pay you like a business. The same is true of advocacy. If we treat it like a hobby, then we don't get results. If we treat it like a business and we try to do effective things with our time and our words and our money, then we, then we get real results. Now, some of these areas of, of influence, I um, I haven't worked. I, I know they're important. I, I don't have as much expertise yet at succeeding in them because we're we're pretty young. Um, but media media is an interesting one too. The way because again, media of course we want our ideas spread around the media. But of course, media doesn't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I want to spread this young guy's ideas and and then so that he and the rest of the think tank get paid. Like they don't care. So how do you make them care? One, one thing I realized that's a mistake that a lot of people make, that I certainly made, is to be reactive with media. Because media is, media is often focused, the way it's easy to focus on media is, here's a story, everybody's commenting on it, I'm going to give my own comment. And now sometimes the comment is original, which is nice. But if, if there's already a story and there's a million people commenting on it, it's hard to get much like much traction from like a new argument. If you're dealing with intellectuals, it's a little easier because they're a little more sensitive and the arguments are higher level. But with media, it just it just disappears. 
Uh, and I had an experience last year which, which really showed me there's another way uh, of doing this, which is a lot better. And it was kind of at random. Um, Eric Dennis, who works with me, uh, the physicist, we, he, we were in New York and he said, oh, we should go to Occupy Wall Street and we should, you know, we should interview, we should do some interviews with these guys and talk to these guys because they're criticizing the 1%, they're blasting fracking, uh, which I support. Let's talk to them. And I was actually really sick that day, so I kind of didn't want to go. But he said, let's, you know, whatever, let's go. This is, this is a good chance. So we brought the video camera around and we, we found a bunch of people and just taped the conversations. And what happened is it turned out this was by far the most popular video we had ever done. I, I did not expect it at all. It took me forever to post it because I thought, oh, no one's going to pay attention. It's just me talking to a bunch of people. Um, but what was, there were a lot of reasons, I think, why people like that in particular. And then there were stories written about it. What I realized is we're getting more traction here because instead of just commenting on the story, we are the story. So it's us and our ideas and our approach. We are the story. And that's, that's not the only way to deal with media. But it's a very effective one. And the point is not then to go you know, streaking around Toronto to get, to get newspaper coverage or something like that. It's, it's in the context of how do we make our new ideas in some way a story that the media follows versus just another comment. And, uh, and, and again, in the future, if you follow us, and I'll send, I'll put it on my mailing list later, if you follow that, you'll see there's just a lot of innovative ways to get your ideas out in ways that are interesting to people, because the, the ideas in some way need to be uh, a story. Um, okay, we have... Political officials, I have to admit, uh, I'm not good at yet. I don't really know how to deal with them very successfully. Um, but, I, but, it's mostly, but I do know one thing, which has really, really, been really helpful. It's just a project that I haven't had time to work on. Um, and, and it's a good principle to know. It's that if you want to influence anyone at the level of action, you need to offer concrete solutions. So it can't just be you give people ideas, like here's how to think about this issue, the end. It's good to tell people how to think about issues, but you need an end to end. It's like, okay, here's how to change your philosophy about industry, and then here's the concrete principles, here's the concrete policies that need to be implemented. So a lot of what we're planning on doing, especially in our second year, um, once we've executed this stuff in our first year, and our third year also, is giving plans, especially in energy, so that politicians can look at it and say, okay, this is how policy should be. And then that connects to your arguments. If you have really good arguments, and then tied to a really good concrete plan, it's great. If you just have a plan and no argument, it's, it's probably no good. People won't even understand how to implement it. But if you just have arguments and no plan, it's not, it's not particularly good. So I can't claim that we've had any successes because we haven't written out the plan. I mean, there are other ways to influence politicians, too. You can influence them with ideas. But in general, if you want something to happen in the world that's new, you better say exactly how it needs to be done. Because people don't like spending a lot of time thinking through how to interpret other people's abstract ideas. Uh, I wish they did, but we have to be connected to reality. And, and a part of it is the reason is because it can be difficult to implement. So last night we were talking, uh, we were talking about Keystone and talking about property rights. It, it's difficult to figure out what exactly should the law be with certain kinds of pipelines and. Um, there's just lots and lots of complexities, and in advocacy, as a think tank, it's our job, I'm not saying it's your job, but, but you should look for people, you know, for think tanks when we do it, and then see if there are others doing it now, who have, like, really good proposals, because there are, I, I don't have any off the top of my head, but I see occasionally at a think tank, they'll come with, up with, like, a good proposal about, here's how to deal with all the public land in the U.S., and that's a really, really valuable uh, type of thing to do. Now, students. Students I have a lot of experience with. And I was one, what, 12 years ago now? 10 years ago or something like that? It's, the thing I, that people do wrong with students is they, is they're boring. The students, <laughs> the students really, really don't like 
boring people. I mean, you're in college, so many teachers are horrible in general. There are a couple of really good ones and they get so much positive attention because they're actually good. But it just amazes me how in, in my world, the think tank world, there's this term like policy wonk and being wonkish, which is basically synonymous with being bland uh, and boring. And yet what students want more than anything, or, or one thing, at least I wanted, I know many of my friends did, was new, new exciting, empowering ideas. But it has to be, there's this desire for empowerment, this desire to actually do something. And if you're just sitting up there just monotone and reading off a bunch of statistics and just giving very bland things, saying this is more efficient than this by 2%, you know, five jobs would be created if we knew that, it's just, it's insane, but, but because people aren't results oriented, they think, well, because what I'm saying is true, that makes it good. Well, no, it makes it good compared to saying something false. It doesn't make it good compared to saying something true in a way that's actually interested and connected to people. Because whenever you're speaking to people, you're trying to get them to do something. So it can't, you can't just say, like, I can't just come here and say two plus two is four. I said something is true. That's true, so I did a good job. It has to be I say something that actually makes you want to take action. Something that's true that actually drives action. And again, we have, like on, if I look on Facebook, we have on my page, I think about 1,400 people, overwhelmingly students. And it's just really gratifying to see how many students I see repeating the same arguments that we make and forwarding it to their friends. It's still small, but um, certainly when I was in college, there was no equivalent uh, of that. I mean, and but part of it is, and the response I usually get from students is a lot of it is, it's the ideas are are good. I mean, they like the ideas, but they like the excitement. They like the fact that we're passionate and that we're actually trying to do something, not just not just sort of say a bunch of, of straight facts. And then the final one, the final category, is talent. I'm almost reluctant to to give this one away. Because this is the one I know, this is something I know about. Because um, I was once a little talented myself. Um, and it was very interesting to see how I, got, how I got treated, and then I learned a lot about how to treat uh, other people. So we have, I mean, I'll just say that I feel very fortunate that the people I work with right now, I mean, like the top four people at Center for Industrial Progress, I don't know, embarrass them by naming them all, but like, I think they're all extraordinarily talented. And most of, the, most of the work I get, I can get them to do a lot of work for free, um, which I, I like doing a lot. But the only reason why that can happen is because money isn't the only reason that we do things. You know, we do things to really actualize ourselves in many ways, and to, to, to feel like we're living up to our fullest potential. And a lot of people who are talented they, they just get beaten down because people, instead of being excited by their ability, are threatened by their ability. And often what happens is they, they rebel a little bit and they come across as cocky or arrogant. And then the other people say, oh, see, this is why I don't like you, because you're cocky or arrogant. And I, this definitely happened to me when I, when I was young. Um, and there were, but there were a couple of people that I met who didn't have that attitude, who, who thought, yeah, he's, a little, he's not acting quite the right way. But that's not what really matters. What matters is the talent and that the motivation is in a good direction. And so instead of criticizing this person and just leaving them isolated, I'm going to help them. And those are the people who really uh, changed my life and, and helped me out a lot. And so when I when I meet people, I, I ever since I mean ever since I've been in this game, I look every single place I go, every conversation I hear, every Facebook thread I follow. And if I see someone, and I'm a writer, so I can tell really quickly how you think based on your words, if that intimidates anyone, um, or how someone formulates a sentence, like I'll immediately go after them and basically say, like, you've got this great ability, why are you wasting it? And the comments sort of Facebook, come right for me. And that works really well, because, because people have aspirations, and they, who, who doesn't like the idea of having someone come to them and say, look, I really understand you, I know what you can do, I appreciate you even more than you do. And I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to control you or whatever. I'm just going to. I'm going to give you some resources. I'm going to give you an outlet. And I'm so excited by what you can do. And so my uh, my main partner, uh, Dr. Eric Dennis, he's he's the result of this. I saw him in. And again, this is this is not like 
anything that I can do that no one else can do. It's just that I had this realization about being results focused, included with, with talent. I mean, I saw this guy write a post, of like a, a news, not a newsletter, a um, news group post, whatever it's called, in 2007, and it was on economics. And I could, I could just, I was learning economics myself at the time, and I could just tell he was about three or four or five levels higher than I was just by just by reading a couple of paragraphs. I could see this guy is this guy is completely on another level <coughs> for me. So immediately I wrote him and I said, "What are you doing? You know, you should write. Like, are you going to write? Come on, write some more. I want to read more." But I said, "No, I'm not going to write." And it, it turned out he was making a lot of money on Wall Street. But I kept kind of hounding him, and he was my idol in a certain way. Even though, it, for the rest of the world, no one knew who he was. No one cared about him in that way. He was just making money on Wall Street, and that was fine. I remember I met him one day, and I was just like like a little kid. I was so happy to have met him. Everyone else is looking at me like I'm weird, because they knew who I was, but they didn't know who he was. But that doesn't matter. What matters is how much ability he had. And you know, fast forward, we got a relation, we had a relationship. He helped me immensely, just with my own work, my own understanding over the years. Whenever I had an econ question, I would go to him. And then when I got to start my own organization, I had it finally worked for him. So now he's doing amazing work in global warming, amazing work in finance. It's getting recognized by top thinkers in the world. And again, it's just because we, we as an organization, really value talent and know how to and know how to nurture it. And you know, one, two, three guys like that. I mean, you get the right one. That that's a game changer. Um, so what I want to do in a second is I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. I have about. A million other things that I think are really cool and exciting, but I, I want to I want to hear what you guys have to ask, and I think a lot of those ideas will come up. But let me just say that so these are like the basic six areas, and I've talked about certain what I would call optimization opportunities, things that we can do differently um, based on being results focused and learning about how people work, what their needs are, what their values are, uh, to be effective. Um, but there's, there's so much more. There's so much more that uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about in the question period. But more than that, we're, in my view, in terms of being pro-liberty, we are just at the very beginning. Because to be honest, I don't know anyone who on a, like, on a, on a systematic level does this kind of thinking like this and gets as good results as we do with as little resources that we have now. Um, and we, in my view, we're like 2% or 1%. Uh, of what's possible. So what I hope you take away from this is that it's really exciting what can be possible if you combine the idea of like changing the world with a true with true appreciation and applying all of the principles uh, of entrepreneurship. And you know I'll, I'll say once again what, what Dennis Barrier said to me, you know, whatever you do in life, including when you're spreading ideas, require results.